record the meeting. And I have someone waiting. Did you get the link? And are you able to get into the link? Doreen, I think you just joined us. Uh, I will post the link again. And Doreen? Um, yes. OK. If you're in a quiet place, you can leave yourself unmuted so that you can talk to me. If you have background noise, you can mute yourself. I would love to have video up so I can see people because I hate teaching to myself. I prefer teaching to people. In any case, uh, OK. So I see three people are in my in the jam. Did anyone have trouble getting into the jam? Four people are in the jam with me. So using the link, the link should have come across as a live link. You can just tap on it and go into this jam. Okay. If you're there, and if you just want to watch, that's fine too. I will share my screen so you can see what I'm seeing. Okay. So if you're in the jam or if you're watching, on the left side of your jam are icons. There is a pen, an eraser. So everyone, if you would click on the pen and choose a color, and if you tap again, you can see you have different pens and different colors, and just make a, just a little mark so I can see that you've made a mark on this frame of the jam. Okay, I see some, I see a blue mark. Okay, good. So three people have found that. Is there anyone, let's see, how do I pull up the, I want to keep the chat open. So if you, ah, someone changed the background on me. All right, that's cool. Uh, if you are having trouble, I've got the chat open on the side. You can uh, say something in chat. I'm also trying to figure out how I can keep the, participants windows open so I can see if anyone's waiting to get in. Okay, I think we're good. If anyone notices that someone is waiting to get in, please let me know. So I, I might not see. It. Okay, so here we go. So you found the someone found the clear frame and you took away my post it. This is what happens, okay, so this is what happens with kids. If you have work that you've put into a jam, make a copy. I cannot undo, as a teacher, I can't undo what my students have done. Only the person who has created whatever that motion is, whether it's a, a drawing or whatever, can undo. So the undo is, I call it the duck, I don't know what they call it, I call it the duck. Underneath the duck on the upper left hand corner is the undo. So everyone has found the pen and uh, would you everyone try to erase very quickly? And you'll see that the eraser is not an item eraser. It is like a pencil eraser where you have to erase out. So I tell kids don't use your eraser, use your undo. So if you want to undo something, Use your undo. Okay. The next uh, icon down is the select, and the select is what you use to move things. You see that I've just moved my uh, post-it. Following down that from that is the post-it uh, icon. So if everyone could please, we're just going to, just so I know where you are and what you're doing and what your interests are, we're going to go through a few frames and answer some questions. So using the post-it icon or the sticky note icon, could you pull up a sticky note and you'll see that you can choose your color and tell me where do you teach? Are you in public schools, private schools, pods, whatever? What grades are you interested in? Are you gen ed, RTI, are you a SPED? 
and how are you doing? So if you could grab a post-it. I have a fastidious eraser, thank you. If you could grab a post-it and just let me know where you are and what you teach and how are you? Because I have to tell you, there are days when I'm just so overwhelmed. I just feel like I just need a good cry. So I can, everyone has the ability to move everyone else's things and make it larger. Up skills grade K50, fully remote, and I'm feeling very anxious. So thank you. Is Learning Center like, uh, like a resource room for special ed? Now, and go ahead and move, and you can make it a little larger so I can read it. You can see how to do that. So if you tap on it and you get the four dots, you can then stretch a corner and make it larger. Thank you. And is there... Participants, I just want to make sure there's nobody waiting. Yeah, I can keep that. Okay. Okay, great. Now, up at the top of this. Jamboard, there's something they call their frame. And right now it says one of five. And what it is, it's like imagine having several whiteboards that you push out of the way. Can I click on sticky note? So you need to use your select. Okay, so it's just moving the whole screen around. So who, Jamie, what device are you on? If you're on an iPad, I have separate instructions, PC, okay. So if you use the arrow, select, you should be able to click and then you get the double facing arrows and you can move your uh, sticky note around. My mouse looks like a hand. Okay, uh, using your icon selector on the left, you have pen, eraser, select. So the hand, I want you to use the tap on the, uh, Jamie, actually just come back into Zoom for a second so you can see what I'm doing. Can you do that, Jamie? Come back into the Zoom meeting so you can see my shared screen. Sometimes sticky notes are behind other people's sticky notes. Okay, so, so this is the pen, the eraser, the select. So you have to be on the select. So right now when I'm here, I've got a hand, but when I come here, I should have my arrow. So I can then when I select someone's item, it becomes the double arrow and I can move it. The, uh, the four corners allow me to stretch and uh, the three dots allows me to edit, duplicate or delete. And so I'm saying kids will go in and delete other people's work. Okay. Uh, even when you change to... to okay. Um, all right, all right, let's go on. So 
up at the top it says one dash five. If you hit the right arrow, we're gonna go to frame two. And I have another question for you. You can just use a sticky note and answer this question. What devices and platforms are you using currently? Are you using Zoom? Are you gonna be using Meet? Are you using Chromebooks, iPads, touchscreen Chromebooks? Is it just going to be whatever the kids will have at home? And what is your level of comfort? And when I talk about level of comfort, I'm talking about your persistence, your, your willingness to just say, I'm gonna go for it and let me try and click around and do things. Or do you have the, you know, the fear of breaking things and the fear of messing up? So in that continuum. So can you make a sticky note there and expand it and move it to a clear space? Thank you. <laughs> Me too, I love training first. And let's see who. Jamie, did you get in again? I can't tell. Did you get into this into the Jamboard? I will be using Google platform, working from laptop or iPad. Okay. Any other responses? Huh. So Jamie, are you able to write with a pen on this? And it's just the sticky note that's not working? Okay, so Jamie, you're able to write. Why is the sticky note not working? That is odd. I have never seen that. So the sticky note is just under the select. Huh. I have never seen that in all of the sessions I've done. Okay, let's go on quickly to frame three. And in frame three, oh, so Jamie, what you drew is an annotation. You're an annotating on my screen. You are not in the jam. So Jamie, go back to the link in the um, chat. And in the chat, there is a live link that says HTTPS slash slash Jamboard. So that's the one you need to click on. I can tell that you're using the annotation because it's living on my screen and not on the, on the jam itself. So if I go into annotate, I can unclear your drawings. So you are not in the jam right now, Jamie. So how do I get out of annotate? If you're in annotate, the, the toolbar for annotate has mouse, select, text, blah, 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 the very end. You see the trash can for clear, save, and then hit the X and you'll get out of annotate. Once you're out of annotate, go into your Zoom chat. So, um, and then get a live, uh, go into the link. In any case, so on frame number three, what specific tech or teaching strategy do you wanna talk about today? 
is there any particular aspect that you want to address? Is a sticky note. Anything on frame three of what you'd like especially to cover today? Don't see any responses yet. Does anyone have any needs? Julie, you're looking puzzled. Okay, teaching small group reading instruction. Any? Uh... Um, there. So my okay. husband's out mowing, so I keep it me. Okay. Okay. I'm, I keep shutting down, and my computer keeps um, shutting down the Zoom. So oh. I am a little, I get a little behind here. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. So, trying to keep up. Okay. All right. And then, how do you run a basic group? What does it look like technology wise? What does it look like for pacing? Okay. Okay. All right. Now that I know what you're interested in, could you come back to the Zoom meeting? I'm going to stop sharing my screen for now. And could you come back to the Zoom meeting? Now, if you're using Zoom, for the kids, you have to teach them to look at your bottom bar and you're looking for the blue icon with the white movie camera. You wanna tap on that and then click on the picture of me. If you're using Meet, you have to teach the kids to look at your tabs across the top. You're looking for the one with the, with the red dot and it says Meet and you wanna tap on that to get back to the Meet. So anytime you take your kids out of the meet, before you do that, you have to show them how to get back in, right? And adults have trouble with this. So we know it's something we have to pre-teach our kids. So when you can, you teach them where those are on their screen. So I'm gonna share my screen and I'll just, I'm gonna share my whole screen. And I'll say, let's look down here. Can you see my icon? Or sorry, can you see my cursor here? And here's one thing that I suggest for everyone who has to do virtual teaching. Your cursor is too small. Make your cursor bigger. And you do that in cursor settings on your own computer, one of the settings. And I can make it larger than this, but when you're, it's larger than this and you want to highlight a tap on a word or a link sometimes it gets too big so this is a size three and you can change the color there are also extensions where you can get fancy cursors but do something to your cursor because the the regular cursor is just too little and if you make it too big then it's hard to point exactly to the thing without covering everything else on your screen so if you see my cursor if we're using Zoom, I'll say, come down here to the bottom, and we're looking for the blue icon with the white movie camera. And that's where you will find me again. And if we're using Meet, I'll say, come up here to the tab bar. These are all called tabs, and you're going to look for the one that has a red dot on it, on it and it says Meet. You tap on the dot. Don't tap on the X. You always have to tell the kids, don't tap on the X. Now come tap on the red dot to come back to me. So that's something, you know, one of the things we have to pre-teach our students. Okay. So that was more so I can see where you are and what you want to cover. So I'm going to go back and just talk a little bit about your setup and what you're doing. So 
what I neglected to ask you was, did you do virtual in fourth quarter of last year? And did yes. you get fairly comfortable? Okay, so one of the things I see with teachers that I, um, uh, the cursor setting is in the settings of your own computer. So you go down to your computer settings and one of them will be cursor. And every computer is a little bit different, so you just, you know, type in your help. Most computers have a type in here to search. You just put in cursor and it'll pop up. Okay. Um, one of the things I tell everybody is that you'll see, you know, when you're in the classroom, you have a presence. They can feel your presence. And you can be very diminutive in your gestures because they can feel it, they can see it, you're big, you're alive, you're right there. But when you're reduced to a screen, it's a, this inverse relationship. So if you're reduced to a screen, your actions, your emotions have to be bigger in order to connect. And if you're reduced to a screen in the screen, like when I'm sharing the screen, conversely, I want to make even more certain that they're able to see and hear and understand the instructions. So bigger, more explicit instructions. So if you are teaching with a window behind you, you become silhouetted and uh, kids are less able to read your facial expressions. So be cautious of having a window behind you. Um, be cautious of what is behind you. I threw up this green screen. It was just a, you know, a green curtain behind me just to block out my mess. And I, I had started out thinking I'm gonna have my cute little posters behind me and things. And I realized it blocked me. And I need me to be bigger when I'm teaching in this little box. The other thing I wanna say is that to protect me, because now I'm spending a million hours a day on the computer, I wear the blue blocking glasses. But I am fully aware that when I'm wearing my glasses, you don't see my eyes well. So when I, at least a couple of times in a session, anytime I'm teaching on the computer virtually, I will take off my glasses and look face to face with my students so they can see me, they can see my concern. If I wanna do any heart to heart, any encouragement, I try to remember to take off my glasses right then or get it so that the, the glare is not blocking the, my eye so they can see that I'm concerned about them or see that I believe in them and read it better in my face. So I, of course I wanna protect myself, so I'm gonna wear my blue blocking glasses as much as I can. But I'm aware that when I want to really connect with my students, and I try to do it at least twice for every session, I will take off my glasses and talk to them as face-to-face -face as possible in a virtual setting. Now obviously if, I, if these were my prescription glasses, that's more difficult, but prescription glasses, you can get the anti-reflective coating. So that's one, one tip. So cursor, watch what's behind you, watch for any backlight, because backlights put you into a silhouette and you're less able to be seen. Watch that people can see your facial expression, okay? I thought virtual backgrounds would be really cool. And I thought, oh, my kids will love seeing virtual backgrounds. But what I noticed is, see if I can pull up a virtual background. Uh, can you see the flicker? Mm -hmm. if, if you don't have really good lighting, and I don't have the best lighting here, I kept trying to work lighting so that I'm seen better without it like blasting me in my face because I don't like looking at those really bright lights. Without really good lighting, this virtual background is more distracting for our students. And even if you have good lighting, doing things like holding, oh, this one's, some things you hold up in front of you 
I think it's because I'm wearing something dark. Let me, um, some things that you hold up in front of you become part of the background. Oh, this isn't doing it. But just depending, it becomes back part of the background and then you become invisible or you become this floating head. If you hold up a whiteboard and suddenly that becomes, the computer reads it as the background and you become this floating head. So be very cautious of what is distracting. You know, the kids are, um, it's hard enough to learn in a virtual setting. So whatever we can do to help remove distractions, that's on us, you know, that's what we want to do. Okay. The other thing I'd like to talk about a setup is, sometimes you'll see if you don't have your computer up to, so that your camera is at eye level, uh, you'll, if the camera's down on your desk and facing up at you, and you get this impression where people are looking up your nostrils, that's not really pleasant. And you'll see it with your kids, right? If they have their computer on their desk and, and they're filming and it looks like they're looking like this because all you're seeing is the upper part of, you know. So raise your computer up, raise your, raise your uh, laptop up, use a riser, whatever, so that you can look at kids at eye level. Just those, those quick tips. Um, I like having a second screen, especially for Google Meets. If you're using Google Meet, um, I like having a, a second monitor. And I just found an extra monitor that I had from an old computer that was lying around my house, connected it to my computer with a HDMI cord. And I can always, if I'm presenting, I can still always see my kids. If in Zoom, when you share your screen, you can still see the kids, you know, they give you those little, little uh, uh, video displays at the top or on the side, wherever it is. It's still helpful because then I can have extra material open on the side. So I happen to have an extra monitor lying around and an extra HDMI cord, but if it broke, I would go out, that is one thing I would end up spending money on um, because it gives me so much more ease. Uh, it gives me so much more ease in working when I can have my kids up here at, like right now on my second monitor, I have the notes of what I wanna to cover today. I have files that I'm going to bring up. I have all sorts of things up on my second monitor. So you go into your settings, you go into display, and all the computers have the ability to detect another monitor. And it gives you, do you wanna duplicate your screen or do you wanna extend it? So you wanna say you wanna extend and you can tell it that you want to have a second display. Okay. Uh, I also like to suggest headphones not only for me, but for the, for the kids. Um, headphones allow me to hear them better and it al allows them to hear me better. And right now, you know, if the lawnmower is going outside, the air conditioner is going, whatever else is going, most headphones have some ability to block out uh, extraneous noise and pick up more of what is spoken. So if you're going to be teaching in a situation where there is other noise, a, um, the microphone is really helpful. And I highly re recommend it for my, our kids. And in our school, we've asked all the kids to please pick up headphones with microphones. And we will have some that we will provide kids. Um, in my sessions uh, during fourth quarter and over the summer, it was so hard as some kids, I could hear their parents yelling at them. And I could hear all the noise that was going on around and they're hearing all that. So the headphones helps them block out those distractions. 
and it helps it so that not everyone who's in the meeting will hear those distractions. So if, it po if possible, get headphones for yourself, encourage headphones for your students. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about setup. Um, one of the things that we deal with in RTI is assessments and small group. I wanna hold off talking about assessments until we've looked at various tools because the tools that we can use for assessments are the same, often the same tools that we might use during a lesson. So while I know our first priority is to first assess, I don't want to talk about that right now. Okay, so please remind me if I forget to come back to assessments. So in your lessons, now um, I think everyone here today, oh, someone is waiting. I am so sorry. I am so sorry for keeping you waiting. I didn't notice if you were there very long. I'm going to talk primarily, I'll start talking about um, uh, the K2 range, but then I'll also show you how small groups and RTI might work or how, how I've worked in the, for the older students, okay? So if you're doing preliminary instruction, the face-to-face -face is great. The thing you want to ask first is, what do you have and what are you comfortable with using? If you have tons of physical material and you haven't had time to um, digitize your physical material, well, then you're going to use your physical material. Now, over the course of time, I have digitized most of my material, so I use very little physical material anymore, but I didn't do it all at once. So if I'm going to use, Debbie, I'm going to mute your phone right now. It's picking up a lot of noise. Oh. When I started, I used a lot of physical material. I have since digitized it, but however you're going to teach in person, if that's what you've got, you're going to use it. If you teach with cards, go ahead and hold your cards up to your camera. If you teach with a book, you will need something to display your book. So if you have a document camera, a visualizer at school, set it up. If you don't, or if you're stuck with teaching from home and you're not going to have your school uh, access to a visualizer or doc camera, I would set up my iPad as another camera. So I used to do this for years in my private school. I would put my iPad on a little stand and uh, take it to display everybody's work up on the screen. I would broadcast it to the screen. Uh, but it works over Zoom or Meet as well. So in Zoom, the easy thing to do is to share your iPad. Uh, I will say that iPhones work too, but iPhones, the screen comes out the shape of an iPhone and it's little. If you share from an iPad, it comes out the shape of an iPad. So it's much better. So I'm going to just show you what I mean. So I've got my iPad set up on a stand, and I'll just show you what my stand looks like. It's just a stand, just a you know, regular old iPad stand. It's nothing fancy. And I have used PVC stands. I've made PVC stands that I kept in my classroom to carry my iPad around. Um, but in the share settings for Zoom, and I, please remind me if I forget to talk about in um, Meet. Okay. In the share settings, one of the options is iPhone, iPad. If you have a document camera, you would find that in the advanced, in the advanced, when you hit share screen, you have an advanced option. The second camera is in the advanced. But if you're using your iPhone, iPad, that's in your basic menu for shared screen. And I don't want to share you 
share that with you. I will share my notability. No, I'm going to share my camera. Hello. Okay. So with my with my iPad on a um, in my stand, I get an option to share. Excuse me while I stand up to adjust this. And I just go down to my iPad settings of screen mirroring, and I'm going to mirror to Zoom. Uh, okay. All right, why isn't it working? This is not very pretty right now. There we go. Okay, so if I had physical material, whether it's cards or a book, uh, let's see, where did my chat go? There, there is a lag. I, someone's saying something in chat and I, for some reason I can't see it right now, hold on. Anyway, I'll, uh, if you need to ask something in chat, please go ahead and unmute yourself because with everything going on right now, I can't see it. So I can hold a book and show it here using my iPad. Document cameras work a little faster and a little better, but um, you can use your physical material. And if you don't have a document camera, you can use your iPad. I can use all physical material through my iPad. The other thing that's nice, I will just mention that if you have your iPad, I can share whatever's on my iPad. And right now I'm bringing up, let's see, there's a little bit of a lag. Here we go. I can bring up what's on my iPad. So this is Notability, which is just a, a note-taking app in, on the iPad, and I can work from here for my students. And I can write, uh, this is an example. I can teach letter formation. I can um, teach whatever I want to using my iPad. Okay, what's a little tricky with this is that if you have a lot of kids working and your bandwidth is being taxed, the lag becomes much more noticeable. So this works. Um, it doesn't always work as well as you'd like it to work. But then none of this works as well as we'd like it to work because we'd really rather teach in person and not have to worry about our safety. But this is our, our life right now. And um, so this is a workable solution, connecting your iPad uh, to your computer. And then some people use the Wacoms and the whatever else, the writing tablets and use that way. If you have a touch screen computer, that's even, uh, there's less lag and it can be more seamless with a touch screen computer. So that just depends on what you have. But if you have physical material and you need to use your physical material, use it. Just set up something so your students can see it. Um, hold, I'm gonna stop sharing from here. I'm going to just stop share. Is there a way to share that so the student can write on it? I'll talk about student writing in a second. Okay. Okay. So if you, um, if you have physical material, you can hold your material up to your camera if you need to. 
it's not going to be fun. It's not going to be easy. If you want to do that, a whiteboard, a stiff, small whiteboard is easier. And I tried putting a whiteboard behind me and writing on it, but I have to tell you that at this distance, and this is only three feet, at this distance, uh, you have to write larger than you would even in your class. So think of it as being in your class where you have to write for the kids who are in the back row, not small group. So if you are doing, uh, want to write physically and show it to your screen, a small whiteboard tends to be easier. You hold it here and you can hold it up. But the second you're holding something up to the computer, you're no longer seeing things. So you're, you know, it's like you have to maneuver a little. So it takes a little practice. If that's what you have to do, I would just suggest practicing it, okay? So small whiteboards are great. Now, um, I was able to send home all of my students at the fourth quarter uh, small whiteboards or something for them to write on. We were able to send home packets. So I had, for some kids, you know, there were enough actual whiteboards. And for some kids, I just laminated paper with, you know, like primary paper with whatever size lines I wanted for them. So I had primary paper on one side and, and a blank on the other so they could write on either side, write on the lines or write on a blank. Um, so that I did ahead. And Hawaii just announced that we're going to have four weeks of virtual to start the year because we've been spiking. So I'm going to set those up again for students this year of sending home either whiteboards or the laminated pages. Oh, so you want to see my stand again. So this is the stand I'm using now. It's just an iPad stand, but it allows me to angle it down. So when I angle it down, the camera faces down and sees whatever is below me or below the camera. Or if I'm wanting to look at things, I just angle it this way and I can look at extra material or write on it or um, I have tried using other fun apps where I would display it from my iPad to my kids. And, you know, when we only have a, a short time for RTI or small groups, it wasn't an efficient use of time. So games from the iPad did not work well for my students. But I do, I do believe in games, so I will show some other games. Okay. So if you have things already made, use it, physically hold things up to the camera, write on your whiteboard, show it to the camera, practice doing that because you'll find that as you're holding something up to the camera, you can't see the kids or do you have it in, in uh, the correct view. So you do want to practice that a little bit. So either set up a Zoom or set up a Meet, whatever it is you're going to be using. And practice it and so you know where to hold it up and how you can see okay, so where the focus is on your for your camera so i just suggest that practice okay so depending on what you teach if you have the physical material you're going to use that i have since since digitized most of my material because i've had now more than a thousand hours of teaching and working online here. Um, so it just made sense to digitize. So I'm going to show you some of my digital material and um, I'll share it with you at the end. Oh, oh sorry, wrong one. One of the things I try to do because moving from tech to tech to tech does take that time. What I will do for each of my groups is I lay out my Kilpatrick book in front of me. And I do uh, Kilpatrick drills or Hegarty type drills with all of my groups. And I have my notes as to what each group is working on. And so if I've got tech 
downtime where I'm trying to switch from this to this, or I press the wrong button, I have right in front of me the drills that we're working on. So I will quickly say, okay, while I'm doing this, say the word, uh, whatever, I don't have it in front of me right now, but I could say, say the word uh, clip, and now say it without the k, and I will, I'll be talking through those things as I'm pulling up. So that's just one of the things I do to try to prepare myself for those inevitable little inefficiencies in time. Okay, so I keep out my drills. I look over what I'm going to be covering, and um, I have it there so I can quickly read one and do that as I'm pulling up my things. Okay, so if I'm teaching sounds, so this is beginning level. If I'm teaching sounds. I have a slide deck of, of sounds. This is just in Google Slides. And now I know there's Quizlet, there's all sorts of places where you can make flashcards. I do mine in Google Slides because I line up all of my tabs of what I'm going to be doing. And once I get rolling, I just go from tab to tab to tab to tab and have fewer inefficiencies. So. I make a um, I make a slide deck with all the sounds I might be teaching, and I just lost some of that. This is the thing I don't know how to keep chat open while I'm sharing screens. I have never figured this out. I think I could keep it open on the side, and it's not doing it. In any case, I keep my slide deck. Um, I make a slide deck of all the sounds. And then if I don't want to introduce that sound, I hide it. So this is what's nice in Google Slides. So I make one slide deck that has everything I'm going to be teaching. And I make a copy of it for each group that I'm going to be teaching. And I make a second copy for that group and I hide the ones like, okay, this one is mastered, I don't need to review this anymore with this group. So then I go in and here in Google Slides, you hit right click and you can hit, sorry, you, you can hit uh, skip slide, sorry, not hide, it's called skip slide. So I can skip the slides or the sounds that we're not reviewing or that have been mastered or that we're not even going to introduce for a while yet. And I can go through and present only the ones that we are reviewing. So when I hit present, I can just go through very quickly and we can review the sounds. And this one is one of my more advanced groups. So we're working on some of these sounds and we can just do a very quick review. And, and I'm talking like three minute review, maybe even less than three minutes. And I can just very quickly do a review of sounds. So by having it in Google Slides, it's there. I do a quick review. Skip the slides that you're not reviewing or skip the slides that you haven't introduced. But we now know about spaced repetition. So every so often, and I try to do it every two weeks, I pull up the deck that has all of them that have been introduced. And I review all the ones, including the ones that I think are mastered, just to make sure that they're still recalling what they've mastered. So I will go through and introduce sounds. Now, for most of my students, most of my students, I need to do a blending drill. And my uh, um, district does not follow, it, it's a balanced literacy district. So when I get students, and I have the blessing of my principal, so I've been very blessed with this. Um, my kids don't read words that have not been taught. You know, I have third graders and fourth graders that saw the word gum or gull and say to me, I was never taught that word because every word that they've ever seen is something that was taught as a sight word. They never learned to put sounds in sequence. So for my students, I do a blending drill where we're just working on the skill. We're not reading words for meaning. We're just working on the skill of putting sounds together in sequence. 
and we will practice putting our sounds together in sequence. So I have, this is a Google Sheet blending board where I randomize the sounds to come up and we practice putting sounds together. And it's just a randomizing function. And if we happen to get a real word, because it's real words that come up are interspersed with pseudo words, I'm still fairly convinced that they are putting sounds together in sequence. Now, what I see a lot with kids in my district, the ones that have been taught, because it's balanced literacy, they have been taught some sounds, they just don't know to put the sounds together, and they don't know that the sounds work together for more than the words that they were specifically taught. I have to teach them to blend continuously, and this year has just been crazy where some of the kids were taught, okay, I can say, yeah, ah, yeah. And they say each sound distinctly and put it together word by word by word by word by word. And they will never get comprehension because they don't have the working memory to keep all, the, all of the, those distinct pieces of information together in their brain. So they have to be able to unitize words so they become a single piece of information so for kids i will teach kids to blend continuously and i develop this so i will say to the kids there is another sound hiding here you can't see it and i'm not going to show it to you until we get these sounds together and i'll say i see the f and i see the if don't let any sound come out of your mouth don't say it don't say it but you're going to think it and when you can put them together, we're going to say, eh, and then I'm going to open it up, eh, and just drop on that last sound. Because once we can teach our kids to blend continuously, then the, the skill of putting sounds together in sequence, that mapping happens faster. And for some reason, there's just been so many kids nowadays who are like, okay, I can do this. I can say, you know, at, cat, and dog, dog, but they can't put all the sounds in sequence continuously. And we now have research that shows that it is more effective. So I'll say, I see the z, I see the ah. Uh. Don't say anything until you can put them together. Ready? Say, do it together and say, z. And just drop on that final sound. So to teach them to blend continuously. Once they can blend continuously, so I do, we do, you do, and I get them to practice blending continuously, then I can go into these and I want them, if they're still saying yeah, app, I take them back to teaching them to blend continuously. But if they say yeah, and then they'll go and say lan, um, then we move on. And so this blending drill of mine, I have DVCCs, I throw diagraphs in. So I have different sheets for various things, hard and soft Cs and Gs, so we can practice R controls, CCVCs, CCVCCs, R controls, vowel teams, etc. So I have various blends. Now, I know a lot of people are using book widgets to do this, and book widgets is nice. It's not free forever. So if you sign up and make these, it's free for a while, and you can have separate book widget links to do various skills. But for me, most of my K to twos, all of my K to twos have needed this practice for at least one area. And if the ones, students are blending the CVCs and other short vowel sounds, and they're just needing to work on vowel teams, what I'll do is I'll just put in five or so vowel teams that they need to work on, and those are the only ones. And in here, so these are my second grade, third grade, fourth graders, and I'll say the sounds here are ooh, uh, oh. If you come across a word that you don't know, 
you have to be able to try out the different sounds to see which one makes a real word. So we just practice the skill of interchanging those sounds. Now, if you can see me as I'm uh, sharing the screen, I'm trying to keep my visual uh, scaffolding where they can see it against the green background. Okay, so I can use visual clues here, but I try to post it against my green background so it's a little more visible. So this is where I'm saying that I've now been reduced to a little screen in the screen. I want to make sure that what they see is very distinct. So here, the sounds are ooh, uh, oh, and I want to hear my kids say goof, 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 because as they come to an unknown word, that's what they have to do, right? They have to be able to interchange the various sounds to see which one makes the real word. And then they can say, oh, the word is whatever it is, balloon. And it was, it was the ooh sound. So I practice interchanging the sounds. And now the EI can say A or E. So I have them practice vein, and I'll show them it has two choices. They'll say vein, vein. Oh, the real word was vein. It ha this happened to have been a real word. But that's what we do as they run into real words in connected text or in word lists or whatever. I'll say, okay, remember our drill, remember our practice, try out your sounds. And I get them to practice trying out the various sounds to see which one made the real word in that text, right? And, and we know we have uh, homographs where words are like read and re read, read, and they have to say which one made sense in that text. So they have to try out the various sounds. It could be read or it could be read. Um, so this is just to practice that skill. So I practice this with my low readers um, up through probably at least the third graders, I find still always need this. And up fourth grade and above, I often don't need to. But then the really struggling ones that don't have the ability to put sounds together in sequence, I would still use this type of drill of blending the sounds together. Okay. I go through this and then for some of my really upper kids, my fifth graders, that every word is a sight word, I will do it with multi, multi-syllabic words, pseudo words, and I will have them blend multi-syllabic words. And so they can say patnen and tell me, you know, obviously I've had to teach, but I bring up my tools. I have the tools ready for each, for the group I'm going to meet. And I go flip, 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 flip across. Now I'm showing you my whole screen so you can see my tabs that I have open. I will just go from tab to tab as part of my lesson and um, try to reduce the downtime of now pulling up this, now pulling up that. I pull everything up ahead of time and then I go through a lesson. You know, RTI in small groups has to be done very, very quickly. Um, I might also pull up my ReadWorks article or some other uh, a reading passage if we're working in connected text. Um, I have digitized and there are some digital decodables, um, but I have digitized some of my work and I will just show it. Or if I have word lists, I'll just type out the word list. I have my word list that I will show my kids and we'll go through that. But if I'm doing connected text, you know, I will pull it up on the screen, make it larger, and, and then we can read. And then I will use my annotate. I will use my annotate. In Zoom, it's under annotate, draw, and then the squiggle line. And I can say, okay, let's look at that again. And I can annotate on the screen to get their attention. And if they say here, uh, it's like, okay, what were the sounds there? And if they don't know this word and it's E, F, or A, okay, so our choices are lead, led, laid. So which one made sense in this passage? And, oh, it's led. Okay, so um, I can annotate on my screen and my 
students can see it on theirs. Does that make sense? Are we okay so far? I will give you a link to my sheets. I have a wakelet that I'll post and most of what I have, I've linked in the wakelet so you can make your own copy. All right, so I can do reading passages. If my reading passages, uh, if it's a Google Doc, if I've taken a, uh, a PDF, I can show it in Kami or I can show it in Google Docs. Depending on where I have it stored, I just pull it up and we can do our reading passages together. Okay. So I bring that up on screen. I don't use my physical books under my camera much anymore. I have since digitized most things or found digital resources that I use. But in the beginning, I put things under a camera because I had not yet digitized as much as I have now. But ReadWorks and what's Newzella, some of those things, they have grade level passages. They aren't decodables, uh, but there are digital decodables available and they're in the Facebook group there's a whole link of people put sources for decodables that you are digital virtual for virtual teaching. Okay. So I can do reading. For writing, this is not this, sorry. I have too many things open right now because I wanted to talk about a lot of different options. So for writing, uh, this is a Google slide, a Google slide that I've made that I present on my screen. Now, in small groups, I might do, if I had six students, I might do this. Ooh, that's not very straight. And I will say, everyone bring up your annotate. So on your computers, if you're with me, bring up your annotate. So under your view options or more, there's annotate. And for the little kids, I have to say annotate. It begins with an an. And I show them where it is when I screen share in Zoom. I show them where it is first, what it looks like on mine, so they can find it better on theirs. So go ahead and bring up your annotate. And now my school, all of our kids have touch screens, so it's a little bit easier. I can say just with your finger, you know, Susie, you're over here, and Johnny, you're over on this side, and whatever, you're over here. And you tell, you know, let's practice drawing the letter that says ah. So everyone, now if you're just using a mouse, you know that it's difficult, but you can do it. But they can draw on the screen. See, that was not very nice. But so, could everyone who's with me, there we go, very nicely done. I can see that you started at the top and you went around and you dropped it down, very nice. Okay, and what I would like you to do is, I would like you to start at this point right here. Do you see where I'm starting mine? Could you start at this point and go up and do it in one continuous motion? So I can see what's going on, I can have my kids work with me. For my kids that are home and working on their, their iPads, this is real easy. They do it with their finger on their iPad. If they're working uh, on their mom's old computer that's not touch screen and blah, 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 this is where I say I have given, sent home with the students, or I will have sent home for my new students, I will send home whiteboards and they can do it on their board and then hold it up for me to see. So if I know that everyone has touch screen, I will do it, put this up. This is at least helpful for me to demonstrate. And since I have touch screen, I will show you how easy it is. I will just come up here and boom. There we go, I start at two o'clock. I start at this point right here. It's just below my midline. And I go up to my midline, down, come back up to my starting point and I'm gonna drop it like a rock and I might, my real littles, I can teach very explicitly how to do it and demonstrate so they can see it in action, in action. Now I can do this on a board as well, but I can do it this. So it just depends on what you're working with and what you have. 
Excuse me. Yes. Can you repeat the steps for how to, for a student to write on the screen? Okay. For a student, I would show them ahead on my screen. I'd say, okay, look at my screen. And um, you have something that's, it might say view options. It's usually green. Sometimes it's yellow. And if you put your cursor up there, a whole bar of words came up. And we're looking for the one that looks like a pencil. And it says, annotate. Do you see the capital letter? A annotate. Click on that. And now we're going to look for the lying down snake. It says draw. It looks like a snake that's lying down. And you're going to bring your cursor down and tap on the top snake. That gives you your pencil. And now with your pencil, can you draw that lying down snake? That's our draw button. Thank you. So, you know, I can go through that very explicitly with my students. Okay, Google Meet doesn't do this. Google Meet does not have the annotate. And this is the, my biggest frustration for Google Meet. When I'm in Google Meet, I can't have my kids annotate on the screen. And I will have to use Jamboard or another online whiteboard. Uh, so I, if I'm in Google Meets, because the school says I have to use Google Meets, I, um, I teach all the kids how to, all my littles, how to do it in Jamboard. And I'll show them how to use the pen, and we practice drawing with the pen and whatnot. And, um, and of course, you have to give them some time to play before you ask them to use it as a tool, blah, blah, blah. Okay. To clear it. To clear it, I, the teacher, can clear everybody's work, but I can have six, six students, my small group, do something here. You can only clear your own work. So if you would go up to your, annot your annotate bar, the control bar there, and there is something that looks like a trash can, it says clear. I believe yours just says clear your drawings, clear my drawings, something like that. What does it say? Just clear. Oh, it just says clear? Okay. So you can clear your work. You don't clear everybody else's work, which I like. Because in Jamboard, they can clear everybody's. They can get rid of everything. That's the one thing with Jamboard is it doesn't, and it doesn't have version history like all the other Google products where you can see who did what and you can get a version history. I don't know why. In any case, they don't have it in Jamboard. But I, as the teacher, and clear all drawings. Okay. So this is one thing I do for, for teaching letter formation or to get them to write something on the screen and we can all look at it, but only if we're all using the, the school's touchscreen Chromebooks or if I happen to have a group at home and they all have their iPads. Um, Otherwise, I demonstrate on my board, and they write on their whiteboard and hold it up for me to see. And so the whiteboard with a dark black or dark blue uh, dry erase works well. And you know, the pinks and the greens, you know, depending on the lighting, sometimes I can't see it. So I may, you know, want to make sure everyone has either the black or the blue of the dry erase if you're sending home material. Okay. Um, I, we've been on for a while now. Do you want to take a quick break? Do you want to throw in questions? What do you want to do? Anyone have any questions that I can? I think everyone should stand up because we've been sitting for a while. Okay. Now, I happen to have a standing desk converter, and I will often stand as I teach, but I've got too many things lying around me today. But everyone, please at least stand up and stretch. Okay, so um, in Zoom, 
I can disable the annotation features if you can still hear me. So that um, kids aren't annotating when I don't want them to. In Chrome, they can't annotate anyway. In Jam, once you give them edit capabilities, they have edit capabilities and can do anything. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm going to pop another uh another Jamboard link into the chat. So in Jamboard, I, because I have some rascally kids, third grade and up, I have only used Jamboard for my K to twos and then the, for the small groups where I, you know, I'll try use it, but if I have kids that are messing things up, I stop and I'll go to something else. So I've sent you a link to a jam. You can join me in the jam or you can watch my screen. I think I'm still sharing. Yes. Okay. Jamboard, the actual Jamboard, Google made a Jamboard, like a Promethean board. It's the, it is their $5,000 version of a smart board that would go into a classroom. And it has, a bazillion features and then it has features that you can have on your home computer or your personal computer or school computer to set things up and do things to use on your jam and they've since realized that teachers want especially at this time you want to be able to use the features of jamboard without the five thousand dollar board but the software that they have is really 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 limited compared to their $5,000 Jamboard. And for some crazy reason, they don't do version history. They don't do any of the things, well, they don't do much of what they do for their other Google products. And here's the craziest thing. The Jamboard app on the iPad or iPhone actually has more features than the Jamboard app uh, that you pull up in your Chrome browser. And usually, Google and iPad don't play well together or the Apple products, but in this one case, the iPhone and iPad has more features than the Chrome browser edition. So if you want to, like this document here was something from my Google Drive and I want, just as an example, I popped it into a Jamboard off of my phone. So if there's something that is in your drive, you have to use your phone to put it into uh, your jam. Now, I'm not saying that we would use this. I just wanted to show you that this is an example that you can put things in from Google Drive from their Jamboard app. You can add images from your computer. So if I do add an image, 
I can do an image search. I can add an image from my drive. Or I can add photos. So if you if you're actually in the jam with me, if you would tap on your add an image, you'll see those options. It's just underneath underneath the sticky note. You can upload an image. You can do a Google image search. You can upload something from an image from your drive. You can import an, a photo from your Google Photos. Okay. So once you're here, you are now, you now have the edit capabilities. Um, before you play around with this on your own time, please make a copy of it so that you're not playing around in something that I might use again with other teachers. So on your own computer, make a copy. And just like any Google product, uh, you just go to your drive, pull it up, right click, and hit make a copy. Okay, so please make a copy of this before you play around with it on your own. But I'll walk you through what I have here. So I will use Jamboard for my K to twos. If you would go to frame number two. So this is uh, an example. I made a bingo board from whatever free, I use Bingo Baker for a lot, but um, I just made a bingo board and I popped it in here. Now, for those of you who are here with me, I can have a small group activity and say, the word is best. Everyone use, pick your pen. Remember the pen is the top icon on the left. Pick a color of your pen and mark the vowel sound you hear in best. What is, say it with me, best. What's that sound you hear in best? And there, I can see kids. We can work collaboratively. We can play three in a row. I can put up a, an image here and we can work on it. So there's three of you in here. I, I don't know who you are, but if you would make a mark on the board using the pen, but I will show you the limitation. Okay, now you marked the ad. Did I say fast or did I say best? I can't see who did that. I don't have that ability. So hit your undo. It is the backwards arrow just underneath your duck. You see the duck in the top left corner? Right, right now it says demo copy and there's a duck to the left of it. Underneath the duck is the undo arrow. Okay. So we can work here, but here's the problem. Um, unlike Google Slides, images that you put in cannot be locked into background. So I can, I can move this around. And the markings you made would stay with the frame and not with this image that I have on the frame. I cannot lock the frame into the board. So this can be really frustrating for littles. So if I'm doing an activity like this and I want them to work collaboratively, mark something, um, I will say, you know, when you come to this one, make sure you hit your pen. Everyone make a little mark on the side so I know that you've got your pen, you know, and what color are you? And someone will say, you know, I'm black. And, and they make a mark here and someone else will say there, I'm blue and they'll make a mark. So I, I wanna see that they have their pen. If they don't have their pen, they will mess up the board for everybody. So I have to see that everyone has their pen. Then I'll say, using your pen, let's mark on this. Now I could put an image of a game board on here and you can mark your movement in the game board. So if we're playing a little game and if we're playing a game, I'll hold up uh, my dice. I have dice on, on my phone, or I know people that put dice in a shaker. And I'll say, okay, we rolled a three, move three steps. You know, if we're playing on a game board where they're traversing the board. But like on a bingo board, you're just going to make a mark. But you can see the limitation that if I have a mark on here, so let's say I have marked this. Here I am, I've marked this, but someone comes along and hits the select, where'd the mark go? The mark is on the board, 
not on the image. So you have to be very careful of that. So I've done it. It is useful, but you have to be careful. Here's where I find Jamboard really helpful. If I am uh, in my Jamboard, and let's say I want, we're working on learning our short vowel sounds, I will duplicate this. So if I go up to my frame bar at the top, I can hit the, if I hit on the center of the board, it'll expand it. Now, if you're looking at me, you can see that I now see five boards. And I'll say, uh, so and so you go to board three and so and so you go to board four. So whoever's with me, um, I'm actually gonna duplicate the board one more time. So using the three dots, I'm gonna duplicate my board that has my short vowel sounds. And if you're with me, could you go to board three, board four, or board five? And I don't know who's on with me, so I can't say your name. So I see two people are on three with, there, perfect, I, perfect. I see someone on three and I see someone on five. So if you are just watching my shared screen or if you wanna pop back into, oh, now both of you are on five. So I don't know your names, so I'll say, Julie, can you go to board three? And whoever else is there, go to board five. And if there's someone else with me, go to board four. Now, if you could quickly look at the shared screen, come, come back to my Zoom, go down to your, the Zoom icon at the bottom so you can see what I'm sharing. When I have the expanded bar open, I can see five boards. So I will set up five students and I'll put one student on each board and I, will, I can ask, you know, everyone, um, let's listen, what's the sound in the word best? Which vowel sound are we working with here? My, I said best, which vowel sound is that? And using your select tool, move, the vowel sound and so the kids get used to it very quickly so using your select tool go ahead on your screen move the eh. i can sit here as the teacher and watch you do it oh i see someone moved it eh. did i say best let's listen again say it with me best best let's listen to those sounds very carefully best and I can see my students work, okay? So I have a video of this on the YouTube where uh, you can see that in more detail, but it allows me to see five students at a time work. If I have more than five, I have to use my left arrow and right arrow to look at more boards, okay? But I can see five boards. And if I'm working with so now let's go to board seven. If you would navigate to board seven. So for board six and board seven, I have just boxes and I can duplicate this. And when I put a underscore in with sticky notes and on board seven, what I did was I did the insert image and my image was just the color blue and I found an image of the color blue or purple or green. So however you wanna do it, I can just put in, like we would use counters on the table for our kids. Okay, uh, our word is best. What are the sounds you hear in best? And I want to see them move it as they say it. B -s. I would duplicate this board for as many students as I have. And I can watch them count out and move their tokens just as i would watch them do this on their table at school so i expand my frame bar i can watch them work and i can do manipulation exercises and say okay right now i have best if i want to change this and take away the what's my new word right now it says b 
est. If I want to, oh, well, let's see, was that the first sound I took away? I want to change best, and I want to take away the s. You're right, that's the sound we need to take away. What do I have left? And I can do manipulation exercises with the kids. Now we know that we want them to be able to phonemically uh, manipulate just in the auditory processing part of their brain, but if they need the scaffolding of a visual manipulative, this is one way of doing it. Now, obviously, I wouldn't go from best to bet with my very beginning students, but if I can sit there and just have two of them and say, okay, my word is it. Okay, let's bring it down. It, it. I want to change this to say at, at. What do I have to change? Am I going to move this one or do I have to change out this one? Let's say right now it says it, and I want to make at, oh, which one do I have to change? And I can see them move. You're right, I need to change this so I can say at. So I can ask them to change the sound. Uh, I can ask them to change the word and identify which sound, or I could ask them to change the sound. And right now I say, this says at, and I, what would happen if I change the t to a m? Mm. Right now it says at, and I wanna change the t to the m, mm, and to just give them that little bit of manipulation to say, change the t to m, mm, m. So the kind of manipulation skills that we could do with tokens on a table, I can do this way in a Jamboard. I don't know if you, do those exercises with your kids but those are ones that i might do uh, with my students and then if i'm working with actual letters and i want to do either building words or doing phonemic manipulation with the phonemes i can put out letters now these are just sticky notes so i would make a sticky note and put in a, a letter uh, there and hit save. And now I have a sticky note with that sound, and then I can resize it to make it the same size as the others. And if I'm just working with a few, I would make them a little larger. So I'm on uh, frame eight, if you're with me, on eight. So I can do the same thing with manipulating phonemes. I can have them build words. Now, there are online letter tiles. There's some really good ones. UFly has an excellent one. Reading, really great reading has one that is free for now, but not always free. UFly's one is free. They're wonderful. Um, and there are other free letter tiles. But if I'm doing other exercises in Jamboard, I'm not going to ask the kids to go from this to this to this. I will try to build more of my lesson in Jam. And if I'm doing lessons outside of Jamboard, I might use a, a, a different tool. But to minimize the times the kids are going from this tool to this tool to this tool, if I'm using Jamboard for part of it, I'm going to try to use Jamboard for most of my lesson. If I'm not using Jamboard that day, I might pull in like the UFly letter tiles or whatever. So you can make it. Now we can build, uh, we can build words. And I duplicate, once I build my letters in here, I duplicate that frame for as many students as I have, and I expand my frame bar, and I watch them work. So one of you is, both of you are on eight right now. Could one of you move to nine? Yes, perfect. Whoever moved, that's great. Okay, so now I see someone on eight and someone on nine. Let's build the word, let's see, a step. Step, let's say it with me. And I can look at them, whether or not they can look at me, if they have their videos on, and I can, I wanna see their lips moving, and even if I don't hear them, even if they're muted, I like seeing that they're actually saying it, because if you can get them to say it, they will be more aware of the sounds. Step. Good, and I, whoever's on eight, I don't see that you've moved your tiles yet. 
maybe someone's not on eight. But in any case, whoever was on nine, I could see you move the tiles. I have a question for you. Yes. So with this whole virtual thing, in the classroom, we could have a small group and there be anonymity between families. But something like this, if I have three students and they're on in a small group, will other families then know who's in my group? No. Okay, if you look at my screen, if just pop into my screen so you mm -hmm. can see. Do you see that these icons up here, like I'm saying, I don't know who's, I don't know who these people are. Right, right. You're, they're just icons. Right. However, if you sign in with your, the students' Google accounts, their school mm -hmm. Google accounts, it may be the icon that they use for their school Google account. So right now it just says anonymous wolf. Right. But unless I touch on it, I, all I see is the icon. So if, you, right. if your kids have them choose their icon for their uh, Google account, if that's what you're using at school. So would, let's say Sally, Johnny, and Susie, um, you call them by name, would we then lose the anonymity that way? I hadn't thought about that. You know, most names are so generic, but here in Hawaii, we have some very specific Hawaiian names that there's only going to be one of that name. So, I was just thinking about it. Yeah. You know, we have that cover in the classroom. The, the parents really don't know what small group looks like. They just know it's happening, but now if they're sitting next to their child they're going to know that oh johnny's in that in this class i mean in the small group he's on tier two mm, i hadn't thought about that um i think that's a that's a school decision of whether yeah. you use names or numbers or you know their code names like i know some people have um uh codes for their kids in their class like deer oh. and rat and mouse and whatever okay and they use those okay thank you okay so but here i can see my kids and i can see them work and i can see in real time what they're doing and help them and i see them they might not see me, and if you're using Google products, they might not see me unless you've taught them how to split screen. And if you're going to do that, the, the screen resizer uh, extension is really nice. So if you're using Google and you want them to see you, the, uh, the tab resizer, I think it's called tab resize, um, to split screens is, works really easily. That's easy to teach kids. Okay, so I might use my Jamboard for this. I wanted to show you, if you would go to 11, or sorry, 10, go to frame 10. I thought it would be nice to have an image here so the kids could know where to put their letters back, but you can see that the image, because it doesn't lock, if I ever, or if the kids ever use their, you know, and they're going to be using their select in order to move the these little manipulatives, this image gets in the way. So you can't lock something into background. So don't use images in the background if you're using manipulatives. Okay, I just left it in here so you can see what one of my failed attempts was. So if you're using manipulatives, anything where the kids move things, you do not put something in the background. It doesn't work. Okay, again, on 11, just very quickly, I just wanna show you, I put a bingo board in here, and here I might have them as I, you know, get your pen and we're gonna mark the words. And for me, any review I can put into a game, I will put into a game, because if you just ask the kids, okay, we're doing fluency practice, read this list 10 times, you know what that works like. But if I say, okay, everybody, let's look for a word, I want the word that's the opposite, of fat. Can you find a word that's the opposite of fat? And so they're going to read, 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 and then they'll mark, they'll mark it. Okay. I want a word that's a color. Can you find a word that's a color? And they're going to read, 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 read until they 
market, right? So anytime I can put a review in that's in a game format, I do. If I'm already using Jam, if I'm already using Jam, I'll just pop that image in here so that we're not going somewhere else. If we're not in Jam, I will just pull up Bingo Baker or one of the other bingo games because you can everybody play on their own board. Okay. But if I'm using Jam, someone just erased my board. If whoever erased that, could you hit undo, please? Okay, so you can see, and kids will do, this is the problem I have with kids, is that someone will scribble, someone will do all sorts of things, someone will erase everything. So, you know, it takes a lot of that pre-teaching of what's proper, the proper way we work. Okay. So that's talking about Jamboard. So let me just show you some Jam, how I might use Jam for a older kids. And if you would just come back to the meet, Oh, sorry, to the uh, Zoom session, and I will just show you what I would do. Uh, we don't have to do it interactively. So this is a jam board of, I had a group of kids, uh, my third to six. I did a free reading class for kids outside of school. And whoever wanted to would show up. And I was doing that in the before school time. And then I continued doing that once we shut down. Anyway, so I, you know, to get these kids, it was great. So I can do this for my older kids. And I put in a sticky note with a word in there. And we were learning suffixes. And we were learning to syllabicate. And they could, I could put the word in. I could duplicate it and have it several times for all the kids. Everyone got onto their own frame and they could practice how the rules for syllabicating. What's, you know, what suffix do you see? Mark your suffix. And, you know, they would use their pen and mark their suffix or suffixes in this case. And let's find your vowels. And we have to split our uh, syllables so that each vowel is in its own syllable and blah, blah, blah. So we would work through this and then uh, we'd learn, um, they'd practice their syllabicating using their pen. Then I'd say, okay, let's make a sticky note. And let's think of other words that use the same root or are derived from this word. And you can see here on uh, frame two that the student put in a sticky note for administrate and administration and showing me that he's familiar with using these suffixes now to, to get derived words. And, um, we talk about nouns and verbs and adjectives and blah, 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 whatever it is we're talking about, I could use this as a way to see what they were doing. So I would put each kid into a one frame and work. And then I had one of the students that came wasn't quite ready for that. So this student, it was pretty easy for me to differentiate. So for this student, I'm on frame four, and I'd say, okay, I've broken this up into syllables for you. Let's see if we can say the word and put it, put it back together. And so this one, she add, what's the next admin? And she could manipulate, and she could manipulate and make the word here. And then I'd say, okay, we want to change this to administration, and then Let's just make the, a sticky note with the suffix, with the T and the I-O-N, and show me how you would build, change this to administration. And so she would put in a sticky note and move it into this spot here. So I could differentiate a little bit for my group. And while other kids were working on finding more derived words, this one was just working on saying the word by syllable and putting it in order, blah, blah, blah. So it allowed me to do that. But when I'm up here in my extend bar, I could see what each student was doing. I can see five at a time. If I want to see more, I'd have to left arrow and right arrow to see more. Okay. So this was helpful for, large, for the older kids as well. But then again, if 
you know, once I got that group that had, uh, I had two rascal kids in one group and they figured out that they could delete everything. I couldn't use Jamboard for that group. I just couldn't. So I'll show you what I did for that group. I can find it. So here, this is a Google slide deck. I made a Google slide with the names of my students in this class. I just put their names in and I hyperlinked each name. So I, you highlight it, right click, and you link it, or you just hit Control K if you're already familiar. And I linked it. When you link it, you can link it to other slides in your presentation. So most of us know that we can link things in Google Docs and Google Slides to external links. But Google Slides allows you to link internally to another slide. So here, uh, they would come, I'd share the link with them, and they would come and click on their name. So I'm actually going to share this with you. So going to share the link, anyone can edit. And now this time, I can, you can see that some of our names are very distinct here. So here, nicknames or numbers is what I would suggest doing. So on our first page, if you've joined me here, pick your name and click on your name and go to your, go to your Google Sheet, your sheet. Okay. What I do is I go to grid view. And I, in grid view, I can see that someone is on Malachi's and someone is on Daniel. That's all I see. And so if I give an assignment here, you know, like we're, uh, we're working on uh, metaphors and uh, let's, write a, let's write a metaphor, let's write a simile, blah, blah, blah. So go ahead and write something in on your slide, if you're with me. Write something in on your slide. I, and then I'll let you come back to the looking at my screen and you'll see what it looks like. So just go into your text box. Someone's on Malachi and someone's on Daniel, I believe. Oh, okay. I don't know who just joined me, if you were joining again or just joining now, but uh, we are looking at Google Slides as a way to see a group. Now, this was a, a very large group. I did not like working with a group this size. It was, for me, uh, a group above six felt like I was teaching to, because I had to mute everybody when I got above six. I couldn't hear individual answers. It was like just too bombarding. So six, six and below could be small group, and above six, it was just like full class, teaching to like lecturing and that, but and getting, trying to get response from the kids this way. So I can see that Malachi wrote something and I can pop onto Malachi's uh, slide. Very nice. You are comparing the beard to snow, but you used, you used an as. So when we use like or as, we actually call that a simile. The way we could change this to a metaphor is to say, his beard was snow, and just make a direct link, whatever. Whatever it is that I want to teach, I can see. So I, I see Malachi. If I don't want to say it out loud, I would write a comment or a speaker note. Just, you know, depending on what I'm saying to the students, right? Some students, you don't call them out on anything. You write it down. And some students are happy. They're fine with you. Saying that. So once I have commented on that person, I come back to my grid view and Daniel wrote something and I can go to Daniel's slide and Daniel wrote hi there. Thank you. Okay. I see that you're here, Daniel. I asked for a metaphor, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so if you would pop back into 
uh, the Zoom so you can see what I'm seeing. And I'll show you the, this is what the grid view looks like. Okay, does everyone see that? So the grid view is down here. And I hyperlink. Now, for each person, I put a home button so they could get back to my beginning slide. And the reason that that's helpful is I sometimes put a blank slide right after number one. So I'd say, go home and then go to slide two or something. And I might just write out extra instructions or whatnot. Uh, for my demonstration purposes. So I could use it like my, like a whiteboard or presenting board. Not a whiteboard because I wasn't physically writing, but if I was putting out any information or any links or things like that, I could put that out on there. Okay? So the nice thing about Google Slides for group work is that there is version history and kids are going to do things. They're going to delete other people's slides, but then you come right up here to version history and you can show them who did what. You know who did what and then they'll usually stop. That is not present in, in Jamboard. So for my rascal kids, I have to use this. Now I've tried Whiteboard FI. I don't know if you know about Whiteboard FI. Whiteboard Fi is a free, I'll just show it to you while we're here. It is a free uh, whiteboard, a free whiteboard, uh, online whiteboard service where the teacher just go back, start a new one. Where the teacher can have a whiteboard start over. The teacher can have a whiteboard and push it to the students. Okay, here we go. So I can say I want a new class and I'm Mrs. Laidlaw and I'm going to create the class and there are various settings. And I would give this code here to my students. I would put that in the chat, put it in Google Classroom or whatever your LMS is. And then I come to my whiteboard and I can do things here, show it to my kids. And then everyone's whiteboard would see what I have. My issue with this is this is a pretty small whiteboard. So for writing, it's just not very easy to, to use. I didn't find it easy to use. Um, and then for my students, so I could toggle back here and I, you, my students would be able to show me their whiteboard. So if you were in my class, all of your whiteboards would populate here and I would see what you would do. You don't see each other's, the students don't see each other's. So you have to physically toggle back from my class, from the student view to the teacher's view. And my little guys found that difficult. And um, uh, for the older kids who were going to type anyway, um, Google Slides just worked better. For handwriting, you, you know, it, it doesn't work really well on the iPad because you kept having to get the, the um, keyboard out of the way to draw and it it just didn't work as smoothly as I like. I know some people like it for math um, and you know it's like if you're in the class and you say everybody write, write down your answer and show me your whiteboard it would work for that. It does work for that but it's not as smooth so for me for efficiency of taking kids from this to this to this it did not work well. But that is an option, as is AWW app, as is Miro board. Those are all options. Uh, Whiteboard FI is free and remains free. The others have paid options, and I haven't found it worth the money at this time. I, you know, I found ways to work around. Okay. 
me see what else I had up here. Okay, so when I give you the document, my notes, I will, um, when I give you notes, I, I uh, my wakelet, I have notes about what has worked and what has not worked. You can see some of my notes. Um, I will have notes on the devices that work and then the tools that I use within the devices. I will also have access. I will just show you my, where is it? Here. This is my wakelet. So in the wakelet, um, uh, these are the codes that if you want to buy me a coffee, I would appreciate it. Don't have to if you don't want to, but if, uh, you know, it would be helpful, but every teacher's been stretched right now. Here are some recordings of other Zoom sessions, and these were more with tutors. Uh, I think actually this one might have been with small group as well, but more uh, specific for those who use Orton Gillingham instruction. And um, so those Zoom sessions are there. Here's my list of notes. Here's my file on the basic phonograms or phonemes, graphemes. And you can make a copy, make a copy for, what I do is make a copy for each group and then make a copy and skip slides that don't need to be reviewed. This is my blending app. Here is a video of how you can use the blending app. That. I'm supposed to remove that. Here's options for letter tiles. So I showed you Jamboard. That's not the only option that's there. I have other options for using letter tiles. So if you like to manipulate letter tiles, I have, I think, nine different options there. Um, one of my favorites is ClassKick. ClassKick is a free, oh, uh, besides the AWW is MiroBoard, M-I-R-O-B-O-A-R-D, MiroBoard, and then the Whiteboard Pi. Those are white, online whiteboard options. Um, and at this time, with the cost of everything and you know how much we have to spend on everything, I have not justified using those. I have found a way to use, that I've been able to do what I need to, either using the Jamboard or using Google Slides for the most part without using the uh, whiteboards. I know for games, using the whiteboards is really nice and I will show you, if you wanna stay on, we can talk a little bit about gaming. But ClassKick, I really have been liking. ClassKick is like Nearpod and Pear Deck. The difference with ClassKick, and I will open up mine, the difference with ClassKick is that um, kids can sign in uh, anonymously. It can be free, and I think I can make the free version work for all year. You're allowed 20 assignments, but you can delete an assignment and put in a new assignment. The, the really nice thing about ClassKick for me is that not only can I put work into it, I can receive input and I can see it in real time. So for assessments, Doing reading assessments virtually is difficult. You either have to do it one at a time, which takes forever, or um, or you know, or else I don't know how to, how else to do it. Except I've tried using Flipgrid to have kids record, but they have to have the printed copy in Flipgrid. All of the ones that allow audio recording require either split screens and then it's hard to read off of half of the screen or else they require that you have a printed. 
in class kick. Now this is just a PDF that I threw in here uh, from my Google Drive. It took me two seconds. I can assign this to rosters and let's say I'm doing assigning it to teachers. And I can see each student's work. So I don't know if you can see parts that are white means the students aren't there right now, but they have done work on it. If someone is using annotate, or am I using annotate? If you were in here with me right now, I would see your work on the screen. Now I've got lots of students and lots of pages, so it's hard to see, but I can see kids work. And I can go in and look at, um, for instance, if this is, if this were one of you right now, I can see the work that the student is doing. Now what's really nice for assessments is I can put up a reading passage in here and shoot it to my kids and then tell everyone read it to me and I get an audio recording so of course I have to teach them ahead of time you know that they can draw on it they can highlight they can erase they can put text in there they can take a picture and pop it in there and they can record so if once I've taught them how to use this they hit the record button and they can record, so they can record their reading for me to hear later. And I really like that for listening to prosody because you know if you're you're going kid after kid after kid and you're trying to get through your whole group, and it's you know it's like is it a five four four three is it a three four four five you know as you're doing these prosody scores and or uh, uh, fluency scores and I'm just it's nice to have the recording. So I like having the recording. And what I do, if the kids are going to do this during a Zoom meeting, I'll say, take off your headphones uh, or you know, mute the Zoom and record into it. And then I can listen to one kid at a time if I want to give some individual attention. And the rest of them can record some reading that I'll have to listen to later, but at least I'll get it. I'll get the recording of it. And the recording is pretty nice. I've been very pleased with it. It's not, you know, sometimes when things are recorded, it gets really choppy and you can't hear it. I've been really pleased with recording. So if you have printed worksheets or scanned worksheets or a digital file of worksheets, TPT files or whatever, there's something that's in your drive, it takes two seconds to upload it into ClassKick and then you assign it to your class and you can work on it and you can see them in real time working. So uh, obviously this exercise, the kids were syllabicating with VCCV patterns and, and working on it. So I can flip down and I can go from student to student to student. So right now it says, I'm looking at Valerie's page seven. I can, I can change what page I want to look at, or I can just go down from student to student to student and check on everybody's work. So if Valerie was at home doing her work, you would see it? Like if she was at home right now doing it, or only if she's on Zoom with you? No, I could see it. Oh, cool. But this is really great for both synchronous and asynchronous, both in the classroom and at home. Because I don't know how it is for your schools, but we're being told that, you know, the desks are all six feet apart and we're not supposed to go up and look over someone's shoulder to help them. How are you going to help them with their reading? Right? But this allows me to see their work. I don't like being stuck to my computer. I'd rather, of course, walk around and talk to the kids and work together. But this is a reasonable option, I think. I think it's probably, for me, the best option for now. So for synchronous work, if they're all together at one time, I can see them work. For asynchronous, and I don't know they're working, I can just go back and check on their work later, listen to their recordings, whatever. I can push out an assignment 
and say, you know, you're working on page seven today and put that in Google Classroom or whatever the LMS is that you're using. So I've been really pleased with this. Now, because Class Kick is not as well, it's not as flashy as Nearpod or Pear Deck, it's not as well funded as those, they haven't, uh, not a lot of schools have them whitelisted or districts have them whitelisted, but they have the anonymous option that where they receive no data, there's no sign in. So my uh, district tech person has said I could use the, it looked okay to use the anonymous sign in one. So ClassKick is not getting any of their Google sign in. So I don't know how it is for other districts, what everyone else is doing. But this is nice, and this can be used as a whiteboard. So I can have a, uh, a blank page and have it as a whiteboard that they can write, draw on, whatever, they can see my work. Um, it works, it is device agnostic, it doesn't matter. It works on all of them, and I've tried them tried it on all and it has seemed to work well. It's not as flashy as Nearpod, but for my purposes of doing like reading assessments and listening to the kids read and doing this synchronous, real-time seeing their work, it has been better than any of the other options. Okay. So um, that's one of my class kick like this, I just pop this in and, and we're doing, they're doing worksheets and then they're gonna do their reading. I can put in passages to read, I can put whatever. And I have, um, wherever it went. So you could I, do a spelling test with a group of them that way. Absolutely, in fact, that's what I was starting to do was I'm making a, a class kick actually where I can put a audio recording of word by word, but I figure I can only do 10 words per page. Beyond that, it gets too busy. I can record the word and have them type in the word. And I wouldn't do that for normal spelling quizzes because you can use Spelling City and it's free and it's fast. But for the assessments where I want to keep the data, my spelling inventory is beginning year, middle year, I might, I'm thinking of doing that for um, in class kick where I'll actually record it. For the rest of them, if we're synchronized all at the same time, I can just give them worksheets or pages to type it in. And it does not have spell check. That's the thing about the Google products. Is I thought, okay, I can use the Google products to do spelling. But even if I turn off the, the spell help on my end, if the student hasn't turned it off on their end, I can't see whether or not they have that setting turned on or turned off on their end. But this one does not have that. So you will see it spelled the way they spell it. There's no red squiggly underline to let them know that it was misspelled. But uh, if you're looking at my board, so I made a class pick with letter tiles. So doing the same thing, I can have them build words. I can have them do my phonemic manipulation. Uh, either with the letter tiles or with just uh, colored, colored chips. So you can put in manipulatives for the kids to move. You can see the kids move in real time, or you can just have an assignment and say, you know, with the picture and, and or with the audio, spell the word cat, and you can see that they've done it. So I have liked this and it's been working for as, I haven't rolled it out for more than 20 kids, but for what I have done and tested, it's worked well. So um, letter tiles, whatever manipulatives, you can put the manipulatives in there. And what the teacher does, the students can't undo. So in Jamboard, once you give kids edit capabilities, they can totally mess up your work. In class kick, if you, the teacher, have put something in, they can manipulate their page. They cannot manipulate yours. They can't undo yours. Okay. 
So uh, I have a couple of examples in my uh, Wakelet. Now, you can't use these unless you have your own account, but you know, you can sign up as a, for a free account to see it and copy it. Uh, so I have a couple of videos in here and I have some, uh, some games in here. I have some other resources. This uh, resource here is my phoneme grapheme chart. Um, and all of these w will prompt you to make a copy. But for me, I like to have a really quick reference as to what the phoneme reference word and the graphemes that can be used to spell it. So for me, this is helpful and I just you know try to pay attention to which ones my various groups have learned so this is in there if it's helpful to you if you don't don't worry about it I also have um, I use flippity for my individual students it is less helpful for groups but if you are giving assignments to groups if you're just dropping it into a Google classroom assignment flippity has been really nice and this is one that I've made um, I, as a reference for my students so my students can have uh, this as their reference so they can keep it up so if you're not familiar with Flippity Flippity takes Google spreadsheets and then you publish the spreadsheet and then they do their coding and then they make things out of it so you do a spreadsheet with manipulatives or with whatever and um, you can make practice games but I made a modified Val Valley for my students and they can tell me the spellings as they're working they can tell me the spellings that they've learned they might know that the E says E and the I says I and the a says A, and they can move the manipulatives into, it's a modified valley, and obviously it's not a valley, but they can move the vowel manipulatives into the column of what, of the sound. <laughs> um, this might not be helpful for other people because, I don't know, you know, there's been a lot of people putting up vowel valleys and sound walls so this was my attempt to have a something visual that the kids can manipulate and I will push it out as an assignment and they would have to just do it on their own of being able to put their sounds into their columns. But for us in Hawaii, we don't distinguish between the short O saying ah uh, and the AU saying ah. Uh. To us, we merge it, you know, the caught, caught. I, I caught a cold while I was lying sleeping in a cot. They sound the same to us here in Hawaii. And I can hear it when people separate those sounds, if they're from the East Coast or from the South, but we don't do that here. So for us, I don't have a separate AU column that are that's in many vowel valleys. So this is just, you know, for us here. They all they sound the same to us here. So but there are ways to do things. You know, I keep trying to move more of what I might do in the class to a digital version for my groups. And um, for other games, we've spent a long time. I don't know if anyone wants to keep talking about games or not, or if you're probably on overload. Uh, no, it's helpful. I was just saying that the resource you have up right now would be good to practice for your sounds too like if they say the sound and they could move it like just for something more interactive and different yes instead yes. of just a uh, flashcards right absolutely like yeah absolutely but flippity um and i have youtube videos on how to set up flippity games flippity is very customizable do it however you want and put in custom backgrounds to make the background whatever like for this, you know, I just made a Google, I don't know whether this was a doc or a sheet or I mean a, a slide or whatever, and then popped it into the background. 
but here I can have just a plain background and you can move things around. Uh, but I, I use Clippity for one-on-ones and for once I've taught kids how to do it for individual practice. And they, there's, you know, like concentration games and board games and different things that you can do in Clippity. But it doesn't work well as a group game. Group games are a lot tougher. So for group games, my easiest go-to is Bingo Baker. And in Bingo Baker, it's free. And there are other Bingo Makers, but I've used Bingo Is it Baker. Bingo Baker or Maker with an M Baker, or B? Baker with a B. Oh. And um, I might make a bingo card and it's just super easy. I just take my list of words, pop it in there and it makes the cards. You can print cards and every card will be different or you can play it online. And I would send this link to my online students and every student gets their own card. So if I were uh, sending this, it says generate the card and my students would get the card and on their computers, if we're playing in a synchronous small group, on their computer, they have a bingo card and I'll call out a clue, you know, whatever it is, like, um, you know, it might be something like, you know, find a word that has the I sound and everyone will call out a word and they mark it. They just mark it by clicking on it and they do this on their own computer. And so and so, and I'll, you know, I can hear them saying, oh, slip or whatever, and they're calling out the words. Or I might say, I'd like a word that rhymes with ham. Find a word that rhymes with ham. And whatever my, whatever skills that we might be working on, and they'll look through and they'll mark it. Or, um, you know, if I've taught nouns, I might say, I, you know, uh, find a noun. Remember, a noun is a person, place, or thing. Find a word that's a thing, something that you could hold or see. And, you know, and then someone else calls out a word and they'll say, stop. I'll say, okay, tell it to me in a sentence. How is that a thing? Well, I saw a stop sign. It's, oh, okay, good, you know. So stop is really telling me about the sign, but whatever, however you want to do it, or someone says crab, or someone says sled, or I might say, make it plural. Whatever it is I might do to reinforce our skills. So, whatever the skills I've been teaching, I can find a way to use a bingo card for it. And it's so fast. It's so fast. If I have three minutes at the end of a period, I'll just quickly shoot it to them in the chat, have them pull it up on their computer, and we'll go for a review. Because again, if I say, um, if, if I just say, read over your list of words 10 times, we're practicing fluency. I mean, you know how far you get with that, right? Uh, but for my older kids, I might do affixes and I'll, I'll call out a word and I'll say my word is subtract. What's the, what's the part? And someone will find the tract and I'll say, okay, someone else, can you find another word? Can you make another word with that affix? But whatever it is that I've been teaching, I find a way to stick it into a bingo card and I just quickly pull it up on my computer, sh shoot them the link at the, if I have three minutes left or five minutes left and um, we get to practice. And often I will use vocab, stick their vocab units. Now this one, this set of kids, it looks a little, I wasn't happy. I was trying to get it by syllables. <laughs> but it didn't look nice. I should have deleted that one. But um, I can put one without, okay. So I, I needed to syllabicate for this group of kids, but I wanted them to be able to practice their vocabulary. I found if I used an underscore, it worked for syllabicating and they could see it. And I might say, you know, 
going over the vocabulary, I could go by meaning, I could go by, you know, find a noun, uh, find a closed syllable, uh, find uh, a noun and make it plural, whatever it is, whatever rules that we've been working on, I will use our vocabulary, our spelling words, pop it into, because I'm going to have the list anyway, right? So I just take that list, pop it over into Bingo Baker, make the bingo card, and it's the fastest game I can do for small group. Everyone gets to play, they're practicing their reading, they're practicing all of that without everyone saying, oh, again, you know, they like winning games. So Bingo Baker is my easiest game to do as a group in a synchronous small group. Um, some of the other things I'll do is I'll make, I think I mentioned it earlier, I'll make a game board and uh on zoom is, is that in a certain app or something this the is game, google slide oh google slide okay it's a google slide i just made put and now i've taken pictures of game boards and popped it in google slides or this one i happen to make in google slides uh and i'll just say okay use your annotate and we'll move along in the board. And this is what I did first because I have 8 million decks of cards that I already had from my teaching. And it's like, okay, how do I do something? And so, you know, I just hold up the card to my camera and you're going to read the card. And I hold up my dice and say, okay, you're gonna move so many. And the kids would play with each other and just mark their movement along the game board. So that's making use of what I already had, which was physical cards, and just converting it to a virtual format. I have since made digital games, uh, but I, we really don't. Um, I will do a separate thing on, on uh, digital games on YouTube because the only place that I found that does really good digital games is it's more finicky. And it takes time to look at. I can show you one. You guys want to play one real quick? Yeah? Sure. Okay. I will pull up a game. So it's in Playing Cards I.O., which is not meant for teachers. It's not meant for uh education at all it's meant for um gaming but let me just find a game because it's not meant for teachers oh that one's not bad it's not meant for teachers you know they don't think the way we would think as far as what we would need to be able to save cards or or uh, save games. Um, like when I save a file, I can't put a name with it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> drives me nuts. I can't put names with the files that tell me what it is. So it takes me setting up ahead of time for my students. Let me pick one. So I make uh, Uno style games. I make um, Go Fish games and whatnot. I will send you a. Uh, this one is an Uno. It's in the chat, or it's going into the chat. You just pull up your link. And of course, with kids, I would pre-teach. This is what it's going to look like. Do not touch the options on the left bar, that blue bar, except for the one that looks like a square. That's for full screen. Go ahead and hit your full screen. It makes it a little bit bigger. Now, using your cursor, pull cards down into the very, very bottom. Do you see the white section on the bottom that say the cards to flip or drag cards to move. Grab a card from the deck and pull it down into your hand. And what you put into your hand, no one else can see. 
on my screen, as you're pulling it down, it flips and I don't see it. So I'm going to pull cards down. Go ahead and pull five cards. I don't know how many of us are in here. If you have five cards, and then I'm, this is, this is for one of my older groups. This is for, uh, we've been working on morphology and we've been look, looking at Latin affixes. So I have perversion, the root is verse, which means to turn. I have re reformation, the root is form, which means to shape. Now looking at your words, so we're gonna play uno. You can play the same prefix, the same root, or the same suffix, or the same part of speech. So you put it out there, flip, that's okay, go ahead, and then tap it so it flips over, and, and then put it on the column, uh, deck that it goes on. So formal is an adjective, and I can put it on reformation. It has the same root. So I could have kids go through it. And so we would go round and round. So someone else put a card out. Progressing. What are you going to put that on? Progressing. So the root there is grass, which means to step. The suffix is ing. The prefix is pro, meaning forward progressing you can use it as a verb I am progressing you could use it as an adjective but you'd have to use it in a sentence to show me that you're using it as an adjective that would be pretty tough okay pick another word anyone have a word with with the root ver which means to turn or for form which means to shape so whoever took put progressing you can put it back and then flip it over. Oh, informidable. Good. It has the same root. And if something is informidable, blah, 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 and flip, tap it to flip it over, flip it over. Tap. Informer is a person who informs or shapes your information. Okay. And so we would go round robin around putting out cards. This is obviously for one of my older groups. But we can play, but do you see that you do not see anyone else's hand? And no one sees your hand. So you can truly play this like a card game. Okay, so this is one. I'm going to send you another game. So you can see some of the other games I've got. Was there a way to um, save that or download it that you sent it to us or no? Uh, no. Okay. There is a way to build your own room, which I'm building tutorials on that. Okay. On YouTube? Yeah, I haven't gotten, okay. I haven't gotten there yet because it's, you know, for virtual teaching, I think we all need games and there just aren't sufficient group games. So this, oops, sorry, I don't think I get, gave you the new one. Hold on. The Copy. card one would be really, really fun with kids because I was having fun just pushing them all around. Okay, so here's, here's, uh, here's another one. If I sent you the link, you can see that one. You know, before what you just said about there aren't many games out there, I think oops. this is one of the positive things that's going to come out of virtual is like, RTI is going to be even more fun now <laughs> after virtual because we're going to have all these cool games now for the kids. Well, I've always played games with my kids, but I always had to make them. Uh, you know, I made physical card games, but here, so this one, I would go in order and I would say, okay, Susie, this is yours. Let's read your words. Which one uses the sound uh? And you're going to read through. And you, you want to use full screen. So if you joined me, are you here? Are any of them that say, ah, uh, no, nope. oh, shucks, Susie. Okay, now, Johnny, your turn. You want one with the sound, ah, do any of you say, oh, John, now put it here in the center. Are there any others? Now read it for me. The word is, and you would say glass, and then Johnny would then take it and put it over in his column. I put out another word, and I'll say, now, Mary, Yours is it. Oh, Mary, you got lucky. 
pull all the ones with the I. And so Mary comes and says, grip, prim, click. And she's reading her words and she takes this over to hers. I put out more. And then it's someone else's turn. And I say, okay, you're, we're back to an uh. Do you have any words with a uh? And she says, okay, I've got crush. Good job. And you put it over in your thing. And we go on this way. So, so our kids can go round robin. So I've made go fish uh, decks and uno type decks and this word sort decks. But like, so in go fish, everyone takes their cards and um, like I'll do, uh, I'll do affix cards for go fish and I'll have blends cards for go fish or whatnot. So I'll, I'll do an affix card. It's like, does anyone have a shun or ION and uh, as in subtraction and someone else says, oh yes, I have the ION as in addition. And so they have to tell me their words that they're using and we play go fish that way with our decks of cards. So I have various ones and then I have, I've been trying to, oh, here's a go fish. Let me, um, do you want to do you want to play the go fish or do you want to just see it? You can, if you come back into the uh, Zoom, you can just see it. We can play it. Okay, I will um, share it. Okay. These are helpful because even if you can't figure out the technology of it, you could play them like with real cards. So it's helpful just to see the games for me. Oh, okay. So thank you. Yeah, good. I'm a game person. Because the technology is still overwhelming, but it's giving me lots of ideas. <laughs> so in Go Fish, if you're with me, go ahead and take five cards. This is a two syllable silent E's. And what I did here is I just made two copies of each card. And this is obviously for two people going through 50 some cards. It's, but if we had six kids, then it's more likely that you would get a, uh, a match and you say, okay. And they have to read it. Uh, does anyone have stampede? And everyone looks at their card. And if you have it, you say, oh, I've got stampede. And if not, everyone says, go fish, and I bring it back, and then I pull another card, and then someone else has a turn, and they say, whatever. And I have, does anybody have explode? And I'm reading, reading, reading. So this gets me to read, 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 or gets my students to read, 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 right? And it's like, if I had six kids, most likely someone would have it. But if just the two of us, I'd say, nope, don't have it, go fish. How many cards would each kid have? Like, if, were we, did, well, you did know, uh, for this deck, I made, I don't know what it made, 58 cards or something. So I'd say everyone grabbed five or six cards, whatever. It didn't matter. Okay. You know, it's just a matter of okay. whatever worked. And, um, and then the next person says, do you have, and reads their word. And everyone's having to read, 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 read to see if they have it, and if they have it, they have it, and if not, they say go fish. But I'm getting kids to read again and again and again. And, and they like playing games, so once we, you know, let's say we have a match, and we put our match, let's say this match, then we say, okay, good, you got it, and we put it over here, and this is your winnings. And then go again. You know, so we just play it like go fish. But I, you know, I've done this with blends. I've done it with uh, just phonemes. Does anyone have the one that says a, ah, a, and you're looking at yours? Do you have the, you know, if I just put out individual letters, if I'm getting them to just practice their sounds? Or I like to do it with words because I want them to practice reading words, right? And if you just told them to read your list 10 times, it's not going to happen without hair pulling. But when you play it in a game, I can get them to read again and again and again. And they don't realize they just read those same words 12 times. So, you know, we play Go Fish. 
that this is this site is the best one I have found for playing card games in um, group settings, true card games. But it is just really finicky for setting up. It's if if you're watching me on my uh, shared screen, I have to go up here and um, I edit rooms and you have to import a room if it's a room someone else has made or else you have to make the card decks you come up here and you edit the decks and you and, and you know you have to tell it what the deck has to look like what image you want on it what data you want on it what text you want on it it's really finicky and I have gotten it down so where I can do it faster now but the first few times first couple times it took me a while to figure out how to do it but I'm able to do it faster now. But it, it, it is finicky. So what I'm trying to do is make rooms, copies of the room, so people can just upload the room. So in this edit function here, where you can just go in and say, import a room, and then I'll have the files that you can just import, and then you, you've got your own room. But um, it's not hasn't been easy, but it is so possible. You, you mentioned having a site where you can upload and make the rooms. Where's the site where we can get this stuff, like purchase it? The ones um, you make. Uh, when I get it a little more set, I'll I'll post the wakelet, and I'm not, you know, I don't, you know. It's one of those things. Do I spend my time learning how to become a seller on TPT and doing that, or do I spend my time making material and doing things that are that's helpful for kids? And I feel like I should spend my time making the material. But if you would, if you something that you would buy, send me a donation. You know, so I will put. I I'm going to put it in a wakelet, and then I'll post the wakelet, and there'll. I'm making, uh, you know, I'm just not done with my wakelet yet. Yeah, work in progress. Yeah, so like I have started, I, like I have a wakelet for flippity files that are good for games. And then I, I've started this one on the, my playing cards. Um, Is the wakelet you keep referring to, like your list of stuff on Facebook, or where do we find your... Oh, okay, so I will, wakelet. okay, so I will post my wakelet now, my... This is my, this Wakelet. So Wakelet's like Padlet, except it's free. And Padlet, you could only have three of them, right? And then it became, you had to pay for it. So Wakelet is a way to, um, it, it's a way to collect and curate sources. So any article that I find that I find helpful, I pop it into a Wakelet so I have access to it. But then I, it's also good for me to store sources. So when I'm making things, I'm popping it into a wakelet. So this wakelet, I will put it into the chat. So is wakelet like Pinterest where you're, you like you, like you store yes. things in it, like folders? Yes. Okay. yes. But it, but it'll store like articles and things yes. from all different things? Oh, okay. Yes. So that, I just put in the, the link to my wakelet that has my primary resources. And then I can put in my other wakelets too. Uh, the playing cards one is, it's a work in progress. I don't have much up there yet. I have some. Um, this is the playing cards wakelet. And then I have a wakelet on um, letter tiles and flippity games. I have a couple of them. But just when I'm doing my own reading, I can just pop a link into, like I have a wakelet of, of uh, spelling resources or OG re or growth mindset resources. You know, so anytime I find an interesting article, I pop it into my wakelet. 
Um, I have, um, what happened here? Where did the rest of mine go? Um, like I have a wakelet full of articles that I find on the Facebook page that I want to be able to save for future reference, you know, educational technology, structured literacy, whatever. And I just put it into my wakelet for, for my reference. Um, this one is the letter tiles. And then I'll also share the one on flippity games or games. So it's just a curating site, but I like it that it's free because I need free. I think Padlet is, you know, people like Padlet because you can, Wakelet's getting better and better, uh, but Padlet was more elegant and was the grandfather of the nice places to curate things. Um, I think I have other games. So most of this is linked in my main wakelet. But, you know. So I have where you can download my um, game boards, some things. So it's it's in the other. This one I know is linked in the other wakelet. So. so I have things here. Okay. Okay. We've been sitting a long time. I I know that was a really long time. Um, let's see. Let's see. WordWall also has games that's good for individual practice, not groups. Uh, quizzes and Kahoot, you can play in group or in individual. So I use, I'll use quizzes games. Are you familiar with quizzes? No. Quizzes is like no. Kahoot. You know, are you familiar with Kahoot? Yeah. No. Okay, Kahoot is, it's a, a uh, platform for online games where you can put a game up and your whole class can play together. And I would play it in oh, my right, class. Right. Sorry? I just, I just remembered playing it at a staff meeting. Yeah, so Kahoot is great in person. It's not as easy virtually because in Kahoot, they assume that you're projecting the game onto your classroom screen and everyone has a device to answer on. Quizzes, Q-U-I-Z-I-Z-Z, -I -Z -Z, allows you to assign games to your group or play them live. So, and you can search for everybody else's games. When people make a game, it's there, you can search it. So you can find games on just about anything you like, but you have to read through the games because some of them are not good. Some of them have mistakes. So you have to look through, if someone else has created it, you need to look through, read over the questions and make sure you agree with it because I have found a lot of mistakes. But you're able to copy anyone else's game free, edit it, and then it becomes yours and you can give it to your students. And you can play, assign it as a homework so they do it on their own time or you can assign the games to do live together and it becomes competitive. So Q-U-I-Z-I-Z-Z. -Z -Z. Quizzes is free, and I like free. Now, there are other gaming platforms like Gimkit and some of the others that you end up paying for. So I've always limited to the free ones. So quizzes is groups or individual. Wordwall is pretty much just individual. Flippity is individual. 
So for group games, it's either uh, quizzes or like the playing cards I've been working on. So, Emily, do you have any contact information that you're willing to share? If not, I understand. Yeah, no, uh, I do. Um, I will put it in here. Or dot I can spell. I think I have it typed, spelled correctly. Uh, yeah, and then through Facebook. So um, either one. And if I can help, you know. So I, I've done distance over the years. As you know, I, I told you I worked in a school for kids with disabilities. Oh. And if one of my kids with autism needed a break from being in class, he did virtual for a period of time. And so we, I've had to use virtual instruction for a little bit over the years. And I've always, you know, I'd have a student that would move away and want to keep having services. So we'd do tutoring distance, like one or two students at a time. But from March, all of my private students and all of my school students went to virtual. So I've put in at least a thousand hours since then on, on trying to figure out how to get better and better. For these kids. Okay. Well, are there? Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, are there any other questions? Any other areas? Uh, what would be like five of your top games that you play a lot of? Or your top a, one? In a group? Uh, or individually, yeah. Or how about individually? Individually, it depends on the needs. And because when I'm working one-on-one, -on -one, those are usually my special ed kids, my kids uh, who are really struggling, my kids on the uh, spectrum, you know, maybe uh, aren't able to participate well in a group. So it's going to be based on their need. So I use them all. Uh, I have seriously used all and it depends on what the kids like whether they like the competition don't like the competition whether they have a decent visual memory and like to play you know the concentration type games or they don't have a good visual memory and can't play those games whether they're you know what their needs are so for individual i've used a million of them a million of them. I think my go-tos are generally my board game. Everyone loves playing a board game and somehow they always seem to beat me or almost always and they love beating me. So for individuals, they all love playing the board game. Um, uh, I'd say and then just depending what their other needs and likes are. I've used a lot of them. For groups, my go-to that's super, super fast is the bingo, the bingo game because I can design a bingo game and pull it up. I've already created lists of words because you know we've been working on a concept, so I already have a list of words. I'm just going to pop it in there. It takes me two minutes, if that, to make a game. And then um, I just shoot them the link and we can play. We can play for three minutes. And, and makes people happy that they've played a game. Makes me happy that they've reviewed without complaining. Uh, so I do a lot of the bingo games. I do, um, or I've been using more of the playing cards for the kids that are missing that, that group dynamic where uh, you're not really feeling like you're together, but in a playing cards where you're turning over cards and playing on each other's and, and taking other people's cards, it gives them some more of that community feeling. So I've been liking that. Uh, I, as I, I'm trying to look over my list of what else I have and I, 
those are my go-tos. I have other things like I'll put in, I'll put games into Google's, my, you know, if I'm doing a Google slide, uh, we've been working on vocabulary, working on whatever it is we're working on. I'll stick in one slide that has, it's just the same information, but I'll put it in a six by six grid. And then I'll just roll the dice. And it's like, okay, read a word in this, or read a word in this column as I roll the dice, you know, just something, or a connect four type of game. So I've got a six by six grid. And um, okay, when you read a word, you get to drop, you know, drop your token into that column as if, as if they were dropping the token. They're just gonna mark you with their annotator with something on, on the slide, but, or if they put a shape in, if I do it in Google Slides, they can put a shape in and put the, just insert shape, duplicate shapes and, you know, put the shape in on that slide. So uh, I've done various. Any other questions or any other way I, that you can, just, or just in general, something you want to talk through with the group. This is the thing I found is that um, when things shut down, I kept seeing my students and I saw lots of students, but I lost the adult interaction. You know, just those couple of minutes to check in with another adult as you're passing between classes and to say, hey, how are you doing? And oh my goodness, can you believe this kid did this? And um, uh, I missed the adult interaction. So anyone have any, just any other comment or need or whatever way to check in? I don't think so right now, but I wish I had known about all your stuff earlier. <laughs> um, this is really helpful. Yeah, so I, I stay pretty active in some of the OG groups. Yeah, I've seen you in, in a lot of that. But um, I, I was kind of hesitant to do anything in the science of reading group because I felt like, okay, people are, can be very picky about what's the science behind it. Mm -hmm. And if it's just practical help, it felt like, oh, uh, that wasn't the place for it. Um, right. But all of the teachers that are there trying to figure out how to use good mm -hmm reading instruction in their classrooms, we still need that practical. So I thought, okay, I'll post it. And if anyone objects, they don't have to, right. They don't have to approve it. Well, but you're not I, telling us what to teach. You're just, you know, giving us ways to do that, to teach what we need to teach, which is what's so awesome about this. Oh, well, I can help others. I'm here for you. Thank you. Or if you need help with your school, uh, if you want to put up anything, you know, get some help for other teachers, I could, um, I can probably have time um, to do that. You know, my own school schedule, we just got pushed back two more weeks. So we're just doing PD for the next week and then two weeks of figuring out how to get it all virtual, which I'm okay on that because I've already figured out how my virtual aspects running because I've been doing that. I've been putting in it all the time. Right. We're starting out in person. Nice. Um, nice. If probably you feel safe. Won't last long, but yeah. yeah, it's crazy because oh, I just I don't want to get into it. It's, I know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, ugh, I get so upset when my my superintendent says it's time for the teachers to step up and do their do their share. It's like, do you have any idea? <laughs> you know, exactly. exactly. And just we, like, well, oh. the whole country is telling us that that's what we have to do. Like, yeah. we are responsible for every single thing that goes on in our country. And I'm just like, we can't do everything. And then they show the pictures of, look at this cute classroom. Look how this teacher made this classroom safe. See, your kids are going to be safe. I'm thinking, do you know how much that teacher spent exactly. to do that? Really? Exactly. And, and my principal's telling me that, hey, you guys, all, they got no extra money for cleaning supplies. So everything that's being spent on extra cleaning supplies 
is coming out of south, you know, the general fund. Mm -hmm. So if we use it up, PTTs and EAs and all of that are getting cut. Oh my gosh. And all the specialists, they'll have to make up for it with out of oh. the school salary and whatever else. So, you know, it's just nuts. Anyway, I, I know, I know. But anyway, if you need to vent for a minute, <laughs> Go ahead and vent. I'm going to just, I'm sorry, I meant to turn off the recording at that point. Oh, oh well.